This is the 18th session of the Chod Shabbat in Shohan Aruch. We are in chapter 277, following the discussion of uh, candles and fire that is lit for Shabbat. We're not discussing yet a case of fire um, in the house on Shabbat. We'll get to this later. But in Saif Hay, uh, 277, 5, the Shohan Aruch tells us that מותר לכפות כערה על גבי הנר בשבת כדי שלא יאחוז האור בקורה. It is allowed to put a bowl on top of the candle on Shabbat to make the candle die out in order to prevent a potential fire. So here we're not talking about fire that already started, um, but uh, just for fear that it might happen later on. The Mishnah Brura adds uh, that if, even if you do it, even if the, the light of the candles bothers you, you're allowed to do that. But he says that you should uh, leave the the bowl uh, with a little opening so the, the, the candle will not die out completely. And he says also, uh, there's another commentator, Ola Shabbat, who says, If one wants to have uh, conjugal relationships, which according to the Talmud, one is not allowed to do when there's light in the room, he's allowed to put a bowl on top of the candle. But according to this commentator, or Shabbat, the, the candle will die out completely. So, um, what we see here is that if you're uh, concerned about fire spreading because of the candles, you're allowed to indirectly put them out. Again, this is not in the case of already existing danger. It's just a preventive measure, so you do it indirectly. If there is, at any time on Shabbat, fear of fire, you have to put it out immediately. Call 911, call the Mechabe Esh. If you're in Israel, make sure that you take the necessary steps. Here we talk about something that didn't uh, did not spread yet. And Shohan Aruch says you're allowed to put a ball on top of the candle to make it... Um, to let it die out slowly. And in the, the next chapter, 278, the, Similarly, you're allowed to do that uh, for a uh, for someone who's ill, and the light could cause him uh, danger. So we don't know exactly if it's between discomfort or danger, it might uh, worsen his situation. So in this case, the Shohan Aruch says you could uh, outright put out the candle, so, if this is, we're talking about a biblical prohibition, apparently. So, obviously, with electricity, it will be uh, less of a problem to do that. Um, just to remind us that the, though the Melacha of Kibuy, of putting out a candle, is mentioned as one of the 39 works on Shabbat, which we'll uh, discuss later, it is a, a, a Melacha, it is a type of work that is different than all others, because we are not... Um, interested in an object or in a, in, in a physical outcome from that uh, from that action, any other action on Shabbat, whether it's uh, baking, plowing, filtering, we are we end up holding something that we want. Uh, whereas with the with kibui, when we put out a fire or we put out a candle, we uh, just eliminated something that we don't want. So this is called melacha she'enatzricha legufa. The outcome, the physical result of the uh, um, of the action, is not something that we really are interested in. And therefore, it, though it's forbidden, you could bypass it easily. And that's actually a mishnah in Bamemad Liki, in the chapter that we read before Shabbat. And we say that uh, one is allowed to put out a candle uh, for fear of uh, being attacked by robbers or by uh, by the enemies or uh, demons or illness, etc. And though it seems like it's something that doesn't uh, apply to our reality, I had um, I was part of a discussion a couple of months ago between a couple uh, where the wife got upset that the husband puts out the candles on Shabbat. And he would do it after the meal. He would put out the candles and go to sleep. And that is because of... Uh, some horrible incidents that happened in uh, in several religious communities that uh, the whole house burnt uh, burnt down with people terrible tragedies and he's just nervous he's, he wouldn't he wouldn't have it so of course I told him that there's a, there are other options such as using electric candles or 
smaller candles that will die out while they're still up, uh, put them in a tray of water, uh, on top of a tray of water, and other other methods. But basically, the answer is that yes, if you are nervous about the candle uh, causing a fire, you're allowed to, to put it out, but not indirectly, just put a cover it with a bigger uh, dish. This way, there's still oxygen for the candle to burn for a while, and then you could put it out. Um, from here, we go to a completely different topic, and that is um, the reading of the parasha, in between, Shana Ruch speaks of prayers, we all know our customs, there's no uh, point discussing them here, because in the shul you follow what the uh, what the minhag of the synagogue is, privately you could follow your minhag, I'll talk about this uh, minhag of reading the parasha twice in Hebrew and once uh, in Aramaic, and the Shohan Aruch says in 285.1, even though you hear the whole Torah every Shabbat in public, you have to read for yourself the parasha of the week, twice in Hebrew and one uh, in Aramaic translation. <coughs> in Saif Bet, he adds, in Saif Bet, in Halakha 2, he adds that if you study the parasha with Rashi's commentary, it is considered a translation, but if you are a person who fears God, Yeresh Amayim, read the Aramaic translation and the Rashi. So, if you follow the full recommendation of the Shohan Aruch, you will uh, review the parasha five times. One in public, twice in Hebrew privately, one in Aramaic translation, and one with Rashi's uh, commentary. And that causes a lot of uh, problem to people. First, because they don't understand Aramaic. Most people don't understand Aramaic, even Hebrew speakers. Second, Rashi is not always the uh, the most relevant or applicable commentary, and read, reading it year after year religiously doesn't leave time to study other commentaries or to look at the Pasuk for yourself. And repeating the text of the parasha three times could be a burden, especially if you have parashiot mahubarot, if you have two parashiot attached to each other, like Tazriya Metzora, Harimot Kedushim, and others, or if you read Parashat Naso, and the parash, other parashot that speak of the tabernacle, of the sacrifices, um, there are so many technical details, that even reading them once, could be a bit boring, let alone read them three times, then add translation and commentary. So, um, I'm not going to tell people to do it or not, I just want to give you the, the background of how it started, and then those uh, who sometimes drive themselves themselves crazy trying to finish up on time, just so they know where they come, where this comes from. So the um, there are two concepts here: reading Shnei Mikra V'Hat Targum and uh, a concept that the rabbis mentioned of Lehashlim Parshiot Avimatzibu of being on the same page with the public. So there are two separate issues that came together somehow. The idea of reading it twice in Hebrew and once in Aramaic started when people were bored in the synagogue. Yes, it's not a, a new thing. That is a problem that existed for thousands of years. The rabbis tried to deal with it. The um, The end result of their attempt to deal with it was the drasha, the speech that we have on Shabbat, that was the, the part where people would be connected, they understood what was going on, it, it shed light on the parasha, it uh, embellished the story, there was an opportunity for people to connect. And until today, you could see in many synagogues, the uh, the congregation swells up just before the speech, because this is the part that they understand. Uh, but before that, the uh, the idea was, let us introduce a translation to Aramaic, because this is the vernacular, this is what people understand. So, they added Aramaic, and it's not clear if it was done immediately or after a while, but they said, wait a second, we read Hebrew and Aramaic, so that gives an equal status to those two languages. People will think that Aramaic is as important as Hebrew. We must show that Hebrew is more important than Aramaic. So they decided to read the Pasuk twice in Hebrew and once in Aramaic. That minag was eventually abandoned, except for the Yemenite community, for obvious reasons. If you try to make the parasha interesting for people, reading it three times would definitely not help. Uh, it will just make the parasha longer and uh, sitting in shul more uh, difficult. So this was this was put aside. But the idea of reading twice in Hebrew and one in Aramaic still lingered. On the other hand, 
there was a problem with being on the same page because up until almost the time of Maimonides, there was still a minhag of uh, finishing the Torah, not in one year, but rather in three, three and a half years. <clears throat> now, unlike the minhag that we have today of reading the parasha in one year, the triannual cycle did not require people to be on the same page. Rather, there were basic rules. You have to have at least seven uh, aliyot on Shabbat, at least three psukim each. You can stop here, you cannot stop there, you skip in certain cases, whatever. You take all these rules, you're the gabai or the cantor or the rabbi of the synagogue, you lead the reading as you wish. So it is very possible that in five synagogues in the same city, though they didn't have that, but in five different cities, uh, each congregation will be on a completely different humash even. Um, and they would not finish the Torah at the same time every year. So what would happen is that when people traveled, very often they would not be on the same page with the community. So the statement, Hayav Adam Nashlim Tzibur, meant that when you travel away from your community and you're going to come back, keep uh, keep up with them. Be on the same page with them. Don't rely on the reading of other communities because you're, you're going to miss on the uh, sequence of Parashiyot. Those two concepts were merged into you have to read twice in Hebrew, once in Aramaic with the public, hence the Halakha that we have. Um, I personally recommend the minimum is to follow with the reader uh, on Shabbat, to look at the translation, preferably if you don't speak Hebrew, if you don't uh, have direct access to the Hebrew itself with all its depth, to look not at one translation, but rather at two and three translations. If your shul only has an art scroll, well, uh, it's a problem, it's a serious problem, because art scroll in many times, in many cases, does not translate, but uh, writes a commentary and usually following Rashi. So it's good to compare the art school commentary to Rabbi uh, Kaplan's The Living Torah, Fox, uh, or uh, the the JPS. When you compare the translations, you see where they deviate from each other and you could ask yourself, what happened here? What is the problem? The best commentator of the Torah is you. Read it, get intrigued, ask the questions, Look for answers. It's definitely important to to follow the parasha, but don't drive yourself crazy in trying to finish it three or four or five or five times every week. That is for today. Um, we'll continue with the halachot of morning on Shabbat tomorrow. Have a great day.